From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm David Feldman, along with the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Steve Scrovan is flying home from Canada as we speak, so he'll be with us next week. On today's show, we talk about corporate criminals with the author of Too Big to Jail, Brandon L. Garrett. Our focus on white-collar crime continues with Russell McIver, our corporate crime reporter. And we go to Texas to meet Craig McDonald, whose nonprofit watchdog group played a major role in three separate and unrelated indictments of former Texas Governor Rick Perry, the current Texas Attorney General Tom Paxton, and former Majority Leader Tom DeLay. That's a pretty remarkable track record. I'd like to remind you that the Ralph Nader Radio Hour is also available as a podcast on iTunes or over at ralphnaderradiohour.com. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Craig McDonald is the founder and director of Texans for Public Justice, a nonprofit that organized in 1997 to take on political corruption and corporate abuses in Texas. Texans for Public Justice has served as an aggressive watchdog over the role of money in Texas politics and the Texas courts. Mr. McDonald and the organization have been featured by many national news outlets, including 60 Minutes, Nightline, and Bill Moyers now. Prior to relocating to Texas, Craig McDonald was the former director of Public Citizens Congress Watch, the Washington-based consumer advocacy organization where he was responsible for developing and analyzing campaign finance and related legislation and policy. Welcome, Craig McDonald. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I've worked with Craig when he was in Washington, and I can say that Texans for Public Justice has achieved more on a smaller budget in Texas for civil justice and rooting out corruption than any group I know in the country. They more recently have been in news big time because they initiated the strategy that resulted in the two-count felony indictment of former Texas Governor Rick Perry. Craig, let me start this way. How did Rick Perry become governor? And before that, Texas Agriculture Commissioner, and how would you briefly describe his reign as probably the longest sitting governor in Texas history? Yeah, he was our governor for 14 years, Ralph, and we finally got to say goodbye to him. But he came into office, he was kind of a backbencher in the Texas legislature. And I don't know if you remember the 94 election when uh, George W. Bush actually surprised our sitting governor, Ken Richards. Perry was kind of a part of that sweep. Carl Rove back then ran both their campaigns, uh, Rick Perry's campaign and George Bush's campaign. And there was a lot of dirty tricks in that campaign, but lo and behold, Rick Perry got elected ag commissioner and subsequently got elected lieutenant governor. And when George Bush gave up the governor's position to run for president, we were, we were anointed with Governor Rick Perry, and he lasted in that office for 14 years. That 1994 election was really a crossroads election. It could have elevated, again, Texas Agriculture Commissioner Jim Hightower, and the next step would have been the governor. It wouldn't have been George W. Bush, maybe. Describe the dirty tricks that were played on this great populist Texas Agriculture Commissioner, Jim Hightower. There was some information about wrongdoing in his office by a couple of aides that was, I believe it was filtered to the FBI, and there was announcements in the papers that the FBI would investigate Hightower's aides in Hightower's office. And that whole background of uh, uh, potential criminal conduct and investigation, which everyone believes was planted by Karl Rove and his associates, really took Hightower down. But, you know, that 94 legislation was a turning point in Texas between the Democrats and the Republican Party. And as you might remember, Ralph, Karl Rove, as I said, ran those elections. He ran every Republican statewide campaign for a number of years. And one of the wedge issues he used in that campaign 
was lawsuit abuse. Governor Bush ran on a ticket of three items, if you will, juvenile crime. We didn't think we had any. It's never been proven that that was a crime wave. The right to conceal handguns on your body. And number three, lawsuit abuse. And so bellwether election really started the ball rolling for attacks on the Texas civil justice system. Not only did it get rid of a lot of very good politicians whose statewide ambitions were throttled because of this election, but it also started the wave rolling for vices out of the civil justice system that would continue today if we had much of a civil justice system left, which we don't. Well, Craig, you know, the cloud over Jim Hightower, as you say, contrived by Karl Rove, it made people think that Jim Hightower is going to be indicted. And that's why I called it a dirty trick, because there is nothing to the accusations except harassment of Jim Hightower before, during, and after the election. So Rick Perry emerges, he runs for governor, he gets elected, and then he says year after year that Texas has been a miracle state under under his gubernatorial reign. And he would tout it all over the country. I remember listening to a Washington, D.C. radio station. And there was an ad by Rick Perry trying to get businesses from Maryland to Texas saying Texas is a paradise and the fastest growing job market in America. Do you want to uh, examine that preposterous claim in some detail? Well, it is preposterous. If there is any Texas miracle... There's no doubt that our economy is doing okay, and it's doing better than some states and has over that period, but it cannot be attributed to Governor Rick Perry's policies. When people ask me about the miracle, I say the miracle is based on geology and geography. That is, we're uh, next to a very good labor source of people coming from Mexico that immigrate here that contribute tremendous amounts to our economy. And, of course, geology. We're now the home of fracking. If we were a country on our own, I believe we'd be the third highest oil producer. So that has brought great wealth and prosperity to the state. And the state has continued to turn its back on its social needs under the Perry administration, which has been, so to speak, rolling in money. The Perry administration refuses to require corporations and the wealthy pay their fair share of the dues for the prosperity they're enjoying. The Texas miracle is not a miracle if you look at it from a social standpoint. It is only an economic miracle because Perry had the luxury of sitting in the mansion. The oil boom continued and continued almost up to today since the oil prices have now started to fall. Yeah, my understanding also is the large number of job created were low-wage jobs. Texas has the highest percent of uninsured people in terms of health insurance, I think, in the country. And the polluters uh, are having a field day. Uh, Is that pretty much reflective in your assessment? Yeah, I think that's a more accurate picture of Texas than the picture you'll get from Rick Perry. And Rick Perry's whole premise that he's brought prosperity is really hasn't brought prosperity, but he's engaged in a huge amount of corporate welfare. He's spent over $700 million of the people's purse, if you will, to, quote, attract new corporations here to create jobs. Our group did two in-depth assessments at his claims on job creation numbers, and we found that his claims didn't reflect reality at all. So we spent literally millions of dollars to help Rick Perry partake in crony capitalism, which hasn't really delivered the promises that Rick Perry claimed it would deliver. It's all a facade. We're talking with Craig McDonald, the founder and director of Texans for Public Justice. The great lawsuit that you provoked in the county that Austin, Texas is located in got my interest because, you know, governors and presidents keep saying they're not above the law, but they are above the law. Again and again, there are violations of the Constitution, of uh, international treaties, of federal statutes uh, by the resident of the White House, and they get away with it. And the same is true by governors in many kind of extra legal activities. That's a polite phrase instead of illegal activities. Now, you caught Governor Perry in something that was described as a criminal action. You want to elaborate this really unique case that was brought by the prosecuting attorney and describe the reaction of Rick Perry and his cohorts of lawyers after the indictment. Yeah, well, it certainly caused a reaction. It did the day he was indicted, and it's caused a a wild reaction from Perry and his legal public relations team since we did it. We woke up one day and saw that Rick Perry was threatening to veto part of the budget of the Travis County District Attorney's Office. That part of the budget is called the Public Integrity Unit, and that unit is the only statewide unit that is charged with investigating and prosecuting public corruption. 
that touches on the border within Travis County. And it's set up that way because all the politicians are in Travis County. And it was given its own separate budget to carry out its responsibilities. Your listeners may remember that our district attorney had a bout with a vodka bottle and was arrested for DWI. The governor grabbed on that incident to make some political hay and said he would veto the budget for the district attorney's public integrity unit to show that to return some integrity, if you will, to the district attorney's office. So that was all a sham as a way to get at and end the public integrity unit. We woke up and read about his threats for the veto in the newspaper on Monday. He had said that the district attorney doesn't step down from her office by a Friday. He would veto the budget. We thought right then and there that it has got to be against the Texas statute. We found what we thought was against four actual criminal statutes in the state, and we whipped up a criminal complaint, which any citizen has the right to do in Texas, and passed it on to the district attorney well before he vetoed the budget which he'd been threatening to veto so the perry's pr team would have you believe that we were challenging his right to veto the bill we weren't we were challenging his right to abuse his office to close down the public integrity unit the only unit that monitors and prosecutes corruption and at the time the unit was investigating contracting scandals in the perry administration the ball got rolling only Republicans put their hands on this case. So you can't believe Rick Perry when he says this is a political witch hunt. If it's a political witch hunt, it's being carried out by members of Rick Perry's own party. And to make a longer story short, Republican judge, Republican prosecutor, Republican regional judge, and a Republic, retired Republican trial judge have all found merit in this case. And indictments did come, as you say, two felony criminal indictments. And the case moves forward. It's now in the appellate courts. Each side is appealing different rulings that have taken place in the last year and a half. But I would be surprised if Governor Perry's campaign lasted longer than the legal proceedings here. So we won't get a real outcome for a couple of years, would be my guess. Was one of those indictments dismissed? One of them was dismissed, which is being appealed by the state, which were thankful for. Uh, one of the indictments was dismissed. The underlying statute they said was unconstitutional and that statute is really an abuse or coercion of a public servant statute. If indeed that statute is unconstitutional, there are lots of cases that will be undone because of the court's ruling. Another aspect of the politics here of the courts is that the appellate panel, which threw that one indictment out, was headed by Rick Perry's former chief of staff, who we had called on and the press called on to step aside in this case, but didn't. So at the trial level and at the regional level, this case has not seen much partisanship at all. But as the case climbs the appellate ladder of Texas courts, those courts get more and more partisan. So I can't predict how it's going to come out. The outcome won't be known quickly. How about the other public official, which you've now worked successfully to have indicted? Can you explain that? That's a little easier, quicker story. And that public official is the attorney general. Ken Paxton, a member of the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party, who just got elected to office in uh, 2014, just took over January of 2015. There was rumors all around that he had engaged in some securities fraud. And actually, we discovered, along with some others, that Ken Paxton had signed an administrative order with the Texas Securities Commission, admitting to the fact that he had not been a registered securities agent while he was selling securities and making a commission on them. He he did not tell his clients that's what he was doing. We saw that as an admission of the felony. It wasn't just an administrative violation. If you look at the securities law, it was a straight up admission that he had committed felony securities fraud. We filed a criminal complaint against him. It ended up back home in Collin County. His district attorney dragged his feet and dragged his feet, hoping the statute of limitations would run out. So we, along with, uh, I must praise the, the media, which still does its job in some part, our organization and some great reporters from the Houston Chronicle and the Dallas Morning News kept on the case. And finally, we brought enough political pressure so the Collin County DA, who was uh, Ashton's longtime friend and business partner, stepped aside. Again, the judge appointed a special prosecutor who went to a grand jury. That grand jury indicted the sitting attorney general for 
for two felony counts, one misdemeanor file count of securities fraud. And so that criminal process is just getting underway. We, of course, have called on the attorney general to step aside. He's not getting much support among his Republican brethren and colleagues. But I would not be surprised if there was enough political pressure among the moderate Republicans and others to kind of force Mr. Paxton to give up his office before too long. What kind of response are you getting from the people of Texas, Craig? Well, you know, we get pretty good response. Of course, there's some hardcore and right-wing Republicans out there which generate lots of hate mail to us. The Rick Perry case generated more hate mail than we've ever seen on the Internet, in person, telephone calls, posting my address, pictures of my home online. Kind of scary stuff, but I think that comes with the age we're in, Ralph, where everything's on the Internet and everybody can quickly spew their venom if they want to. So we certainly got a reaction. I don't think it's a majority reaction. We get lots of calls that will, uh, uh, we don't make much money, but some of the letters in we of support we read kind of warm your cockles. Uh, thanks for being a watchdog that will hold politicians accountable, not depending on which political party they're from. So the reaction's mixed, and we'll see what kind of reaction we get if Ken Paxton resigns and or faces criminal charges in front of a jury. Have there been any polls on what you've done, pro and con? No, I haven't seen any uh, public polling yet. And have there been any other cases in other states stimulated by your example? I mean, we do see mayors going to jail after being caught with money and government contracts and all that. That's pretty routine. But your case is really unique. It is the kind of intimidation that, in effect, exposes innocent people to the lack of prosecution of the crooks who are abusing them. And that's what the public integrity section was trying to do to protect the people of Texas. And here's Rick Perry taking it out on the head of it by saying, I'm going to make sure you don't have a budget so you can protect the people of Texas from all this political corruption. Is any of this spilled over to other states? Have you gotten contacts from the other states? You know, I haven't seen it yet, Ralph, but it was also Rick Perry himself on the day of his indictment. He had a press conference to turn it into a campaign rally to uh, say, well, this is just a witch hunt and uh, I fight this. I won't stand for it. And part of his persona and platform, if you will, he went so overboard saying that the people who are responsible for this will pay, that the judge had to admonish him publicly and tell him that if he continued to intimidate witnesses, that he would suffer the consequences. So the reaction to us is overboard from the top down. It's just not right wing believers on the streets. This comes from Governor Perry on down himself. You get any support in the legislature, the infamous Texas legislature that's so dominated. Yeah, we, get, we don't get a majority of repo- uh, support, though, but maybe if there was a private vote on some of this, uh, uh, they would take our side. You know, people get the wrong impression, though, kind of about our organization, that this is all we do. As I tell people, this is a small part of what we do. We have a three-pronged purpose, research, advocacy for open government and responsibility, and accountability. So this kind of fits into our accountability pocket. And we do very little of this with respect to how much time it takes us and the effort and resources we put in. But we find that no one else is doing this accountability. There's the Democratic Party didn't stand up. The Paxton's opponents, while they criticized him for this behavior before he was indicted, didn't really stand up. So I think this leaves a vacuum for public interest groups like us working with the press. Again, we don't always get great response from the press, but in the Paxton case, we've gotten some pretty good reporters who stuck with us, despite the demands on them to produce a daily story that's not related to political corruption. They stuck with it, and they helped move this thing forward. So I have total respect for some members of the press down here, without whom we couldn't do what we do. Well, before we get to the other subject, which is how the corporate powers in the Republican Party have closed the courtroom door on thousands of wrongfully injured Texans who can't have their day in court because of what's called the grotesquely tort reform. Tell people how they can reach you, how you can be helped, and how large is your staff, in addition to the stalwart Andrew Wheat, who has been working with you for years. That's right. Andrew Wheat's our research director. He's been there since we formed this group 16 years ago. He's kind of the core. As I say, I do all the radio, but he does all the thinking. Uh, <laughs> And you can uh, 
Uh, you can reach us. We have a website, tpj.org, as in Texans for Public Justice, tpj.org. And, of course, when you go to that website, you can see how you can help us, either with kind-hearted letters of support and or financial support. And we also, you can get our contact to our uh, Twitter page and get on our mailing list at that website. And how, how well, large is your staff? Staff is three people. It ranges from three to five, so it's between three and five over the years, with, you know, a couple of sharp interns from colleges around the region. There you are, listeners. See what I mean? Again and again, I keep saying, look how few people can make a difference, because what Craig and Texans for Public Justice are doing is not only extremely substantiated, but it reflects public sentiment. Let's face it, if you're liberal, conservative, libertarian, progressive in Texas, it doesn't matter. They don't like crooked politicians. They want honest politics. They may have different views on what the government in Texas should be doing and not doing, but they don't want politicians trying to corrupt the process, block law enforcement when it services their own needs, and make sure that the laws don't protect you, the average worker, the consumer, the small Texas taxpayer. What were you saying, David? I was just curious, before we move on, the role that Craig played in the defanging of former Majority Leader Tom DeLay. Yes, well, it was a similar role, but it, it, was, it was just a longer time ago, I guess. it was. We believe they cheated on the 2002 elections. And as I say, research is part of our uh, agenda. We have a database with every campaign contribution in it, every lobby contract in it. And we discovered during reviewing the money from that election that Tom DeLay's political action committee called Texans for a Republican Majority was cheating by using corporate money, which is illegal in Texas. There aren't too many campaign laws in Texas, but the populist law from 1903 still carries over that corporations cannot give directly to candidates. And and again, we found that Tom DeLay was cheating. That litigation went on for 10 years. There was a trial. He was found guilty. We were the first ones to testify against him in that trial. And of course, he had to give up his post as minority leader of the House, or majority leader of the House. And finally, shortly after, had to give up his seat in Congress. That was a, a, an incredibly large fish that I didn't think anybody could bring down at the time. Did he do prison time? Because it, it seems like a lot of those charges have been dismissed, right? That's right. He was sentenced to prison time. He got three years and, and then five years probation on the second count. Going in, I think I ne we never thought that he would serve a day in prison, and he didn't. And again, my talk about Republican higher courts, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is all Republican, their statewide highest court for criminal matters, reversed his conviction last year, maybe two years ago now. So check that. This is the guy who invented K Street, basically, right, Ralph? Yeah, he was really corrupt in Congress. I mean, he was blatant about it. He would basically say, OK, the Republicans won the House and we're going to bring all these K Street lobbyists and put them on the staff of committees. And, and he would shake down people. I know corporate people who didn't like the way he shook them down. He basically say, OK, you want us to do what you want, you better fork over money. I mean, the guy was blatant. He was shameless. But one thing about the higher courts in Texas, like the Supreme Court of Texas, is elected judiciary, and it's reflective of big commercial money in judicial elections. I mean, it's a national scandal, the Texas Supreme Court. It turned around the whole system of civil justice and made it very difficult for people who are exposed to toxic waste, defective automobiles, you name it, to have their day in court against the perpetrators of their harm, which is what we want to get into in the remaining minutes, Craig. I put out a report on the inability of Texas trial lawyers to defend the very civil justice system they helped build over the years. And it started in the early 90s with the weakening of the workers' compensation laws. They were among the best in the country. And it's been downhill ever since as the corporations went even to the level of, of amending the Texas Constitution, which basically says you will not deprive people of their trial by jury in a personal injury case. Can you describe briefly the general scene and the, the work that you've done to publicize this travesty, this stripping the people of Texas from so many of their federal as well as state constitutional rights? And what the likelihood of a turnaround is? I harbor the hope that some of these rich plaintiff trial lawyers will start funding groups to take on the front groups of the 
tort deform insurance industry movement, which they they call themselves Texans against lawsuit abuse. Yeah, well, as you say, the assault on the tort system really started with the battles over workers' comp. Now, if you have a workers' comp claim, you can't get a lawyer uh, under 10% of the claims these days. Do the claimants have access to an attorney? But that was just the start. Both the Texas courts and the Texas legislature have played in undermining the civil justice system. You rightly described our Supreme Court, Ralph, and we call that a capture court during the partisan switch from Democratic single-party rule in Texas to Republican single-party rule. The bellwether battles, the wedge issue in those battles, used by Karl Rove, his strategy, was lawsuit abuse or tort reform. And the tort reformers have had their way with the citizens of Texas ever since, hated by the members of the Texas Supreme Court. So while the legislature will pass every tort reform it sees along the way, the court reinforces that and helps them out. The Supreme Court's over the last 10 years has reversed 70 four percent of all the jury verdicts in uh, civil jury cases. So they are just uh, slapping in the face the role of the civil jury, and they are doing tort reform by opinion out of the Supreme Court, and that's coincided with the legislature. We virtually have little to no civil justice rights left in Texas. Craig, let me ask you, what's the likelihood of a turnaround? The Democratic Party has been a minority party. As long as the presidential candidates for the Democratic Party don't even campaign in Texas. They can see Texas to their Republican opponent. Ben Barnes, the political leader for many years in Texas, once told me, he said, you know, when the Democrats do not compete in Texas for the presidential election, it affects uh, the, the prospects of Democrats winning all the way down to the local city council of Midland, Texas. It weakens the party all the way down the ladder. So what do you see, A, in terms of a resurgent civic movement that you are part of leading, as well as a more progressive Democrat? I hear from Washington there are some signs that the Democrats are waking up. Well, well, I hope so. It would be about time. You know, uh, since 1994, there have been 113 statewide elections, partisan elections, and the Democrats are zero for 113. That doesn't really work to open up the pockets of some of the big Democratic funders. But I think some of them really know, as you just articulated, that if you don't have some strong leaders and a candidacy at the top, you're going to start losing all the way down to the bottom. We do have a criticism of a piece of that strategy. And then when it comes to the campaign season, the statewide candidates who have virtually at times no hope of winning election suck up all the campaign money. Wendy Davis, who I think is a fine woman and was a great legislator, her statewide election prospects were not particularly great. And I think everyone knew that. I'm not the only one to say that. Yet the trial lawyers and the progressive community spent $40 million on the Wendy Davis campaign. And yet, at the same time, nonprofit organizations and organizations that could build infrastructure are begging on the streets. So I I think the priorities still aren't great in Texas for rebuilding an opposition to the corporate community here. And I don't know when that's going to happen. We've been talking to people about the need to change their strategies, put more money in infrastructure, but that's not very sexy. You know, the big money people want to throw money at the top instead of seeding action at the bottom. Well, nothing discourages you or Andrew Wheat or the Texans for Public Justice. Thank you very much, Craig, for this discussion. Tell people again how they can reach you. And whether you put out a newsletter or they can look at your blog. We have a distribution list. We have about three, 4,000 people on our email distribution list, and I think that's the best way to see what we do. And you can sign up for that list at www.tpj, initials for Texas Republic Justice, dot org. Thank you very much, Craig McDonald. To be continued. We've been speaking with Craig McDonald, director of Texans for Public Justice, Go to tpj.org for more information. We'll be right back after we hear from Russell McIver, the corporate crime reporter. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Wednesday, August 19, 2015. I'm Russell McIver. Felony charges were filed in New Orleans this week against Black Elk Energy in connection with a 2012 explosion at an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico that killed three workers and badly injured three others. 
University of Maryland law professor Rena Steinger is the author of the new book, Why Not Jail? Steinger says the indictment in the Black Elk Energy case is momentous because offshore drilling in deep water is the equivalent of the Wild West without a sheriff. If this most dangerous of industries goes so far as to kill its workers, now at least the company will pay. I only hope a few senior managers are indicted, Steinzer said. Three workers were killed here in an entirely preventable explosion caused by reckless disregard of fundamental safety rules. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Our next guest is the author of Too Big to Jail. His name is Brandon L. Garrett. Professor Garrett teaches law at the University of Virginia School of Law, where he has been a professor since 2005. His research on our criminal justice system has ranged from the lessons to be learned from cases where innocent people were exonerated by DNA tests to research on false confessions, forensics, and eyewitness memory to the difficult compromises that prosecutors reach when targeting the largest corporations in the world. Welcome, Brandon L. Garrett. Thank you for having me. Yes, welcome, Professor Garrett. We've got a lot to cover in just 20 minutes, but I do want to start before we get to the corporate crime issue, which is one of your expertise. Describe how a few law students and law professors started this Innocence Project, which has exonerated quite a few number of people on death row. And what's its present status? This is a great story. Well, there are a lot of innocence projects. There's not just one. There's an entire innocence network out there. Some of the first innocence projects were started at Cardozo Law School by Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. And uh, there's the Center for Wrongful Convictions in Chicago at Northwestern University, which got started a little bit later in the 1990s. So really, as DNA testing first became available in criminal cases, and it was first used to free people in the U.S. in 1989, some lawyers realized early on, particularly Peter Neufeld and Barry Sheck, that this would be a powerful tool to free the innocent. Peter and Barry were starting to get so many letters in the mail, they decided to start a clinic at Cardozo, and uh, other law schools followed suit. There have now been 330 people freed by DNA testing in the United States, 20 people who had been sentenced to death. And there's now a network of these innocence projects, dozens of them in, in just about every state in the U.S. Some states have multiple projects. The, the network ranges internationally. There are now innocence projects. And many of them are run as, as clinics at law schools in the U.K., in Australia, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, all around the world. So it's an international movement that began with clinics at a couple of law schools in the U.S. Professor Garrett, give a personal example of a convicted felon on death row heading for execution and saved by these students and law professors on their Innocence Project effort. Sure. In death row cases, there are usually a team of lawyers involved. But one, one example comes out of Virginia, where I live and teach. Earl Washington Jr. came within nine days of execution in the 1980s. In fact, it was a jailhouse lawyer, a really good jailhouse lawyer, that saved his life initially. Another inmate on death row in Virginia realized that Earl Washington, he's really slow. He couldn't even write his own name right. How is he supposed to file a habeas petition and avert his execution? He can't do anything himself. And so he filed the case that big law firms then took on, New York law firms took on it as a pro bono matter. They went to the Supreme Court on the right to have a lawyer during state habeas, and they lost. And so now he was facing the death penalty again. A team of volunteer lawyers took his case on, but it wasn't until the early 90s that it became an Innocence Project case when it was realized that, wait a minute, it was a murder and a rape in Culpeper, Virginia. The victim just briefly described to police that she'd been raped and stabbed by a black man before she died. No one had ever tested that forensic evidence since the time of the trial in 1984. And back then they had, you know, ABO blood typing. You know, they knew the blood type of the attacker. And actually the blood type that they had was inconsistent with Earl Washington's. So even the blood typing suggested that there was a problem. So in 1993, the Innocence Project comes in and they do DNA tests. And it seems to exclude them, but there's a second test, which they never tell them the results of. The governor was changing in Virginia. Governor Wilder was stepping down. And in the last hours of his administration, Wilder says, the, the deal is this. I'll give you clemency. You leave death row, but you're still going to do life in prison. Well, the Innocence Project stuck with that case. And when journalists started looking into it, 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 it everyone learned that, wait a minute, that second test turned out it cleared him after all. And the Innocence Project lawyers and other lawyers who've been working on this case for years 
did another round of DNA testing, which conclusively proved his innocence again, and also matched another individual, who a serial murderer, who was in prison but was not in prison in the early 80s when this Culpeper murder was committed. So finally, in almost 20 years after Earl Washington had been sentenced to death, he spent nine years on death row, he was finally cleared. And, uh, and a lot came out of that case, actually. The project helped to free him. But exonerating him made clear that there was no avenue for someone like Earl Washington to actually get DNA testing. They just got it because the, the attorney general realized it was important and they ultimately agreed to the testing, but it took a long time to even get the test. And so a law was passed in Virginia to allow DNA testing to be done in, in any criminal case where it could show innocence. And the governor at the time realized, well, wait a minute, you know, how many other cases, old cases like this, are there where we can do DNA tests? They ended up doing a, he said, test 30 old cases and just see if there's evidence saved. And if, well, out of those 30 random cases they picked, they exonerated three other individuals. And that led to an even bigger audit, testing more and more old cases in Virginia. And so, you know, these hard work by some good lawyers and with law students helping them can have enormous repercussions. Yeah, it's a great story and it gets greater every year. What's the analogy with corporate crime? Is there anything going on comparable to the Innocence Project on law schools around the country, including the University of Virginia Law School, where you teach Brandon Garrett? Is there any activity? Are there courses on corporate crime? Are there clinics dealing with corporate crime on consumers, on workers, on the environment? Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what's going on? Before you get to your uh, excellent book, which is called Too Big to Jail, How Prosecutors Compromise with Corporations. Well, I should mention Too Big to Jail. I talked about the story of there, there has been one corporation that was exonerated. It was found innocent based on evidence that prosecutors had concealed. But that's not an everyday occurrence. It's not but no, no, DNA, no DNA. No DNA. Right? <laughs> no, no, no DNA. <laughs> Corporations don't usually commit sexual assaults. I teach corporate crime-related courses here at Virginia. There are more and more professors that are teaching white-collar classes, even specialized corporate crime classes that you didn't even see 10 years ago. Courses just about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, for example. And part of the reason why is that there, there's so much more work for students. There's so many major corporate investigations going on that law firms need to staff. And students realize that this is an exciting area of practice and that they can do a lot of good. You know, even on the defense side, you know, a lot of what lawyers are doing is investigating major corporate scandals and cases, trying to explore with the company what happened, who's responsible, how do we fix it, how do we make sure that the compliance is right so it doesn't happen again. And some lawyers that don't want to do litigation, that, that's really attractive. They're sort of they're problem solvers, and they, they like that aspect of the work. Other students want to be, you know, white-collar litigators. They want to be federal prosecutors. They want to do white-collar defense work. Here at UVA, we hired uh, Steve Braga, who teaches a white collar from the defense perspective class. So again, many more specialized courses dealing with corporate crime all around the country. We've also had students, we're going to talk about my book a little bit, so students helped with the research that led to the book by suing the Department of Justice. Our First Amendment clinic filed two Freedom of Information Act suits to try to uncover corporate prosecution agreements that had been sealed, kept from the public eye, and they ultimately were quite successful and obtained a couple of dozen of these these agreements that had been under wraps with corporations. Explain that a little bit. These are non-prosecution agreements that the Justice Department attorneys entered in with corporate lawyers? Yes, it might help to explain a little bit how I got into writing this book. Normally, criminal cases aren't secret unless it's national security or something like that. And even then, you know that the case happened. But if there's special national security information, the case itself might be sealed by a judge. Most criminal cases don't go to a trial. They're settled in court with plea bargains and the criminal defendant is convicted. Some criminal defendants, although fewer and fewer, roll the dice and go to trial, and typically they are also convicted, although every year a small percentage are acquitted or the charges are dismissed. And so normally you can find out good information about what happens in the criminal justice system, at least in federal court, because there are statistics kept on what kinds of convictions did we have this year, who was sentenced. They even have information about corporations, how many corporations a year are prosecuted. Usually less than 200 are prosecuted each year. Now, what started to change starting in around 2003 was that the Department of Justice started doing something different with some of the biggest corporations. 
rather than have it be a conviction in court, which is public, you know what happened, you can look it up on the dockets, they started entering these out-of-court deals or largely out-of-court deals with corporations. You start to see a rise of deferred and non-prosecution agreements. Now, deferred prosecution agreements are filed in court, but nothing happens with the case. They file the initial documents and basically say, we all agree that this case should be stayed or sort of frozen in time on the judge's docket for two to three years. Nothing will happen. And at the end of the two to three years, if the company has satisfied all the conditions, they paid the fine, they did the compliance, the case will be dismissed. There will be no indictment, no criminal record, no further consequence for the company. Non-prosecution agreements are not even filed in court. The prosecutors say, we agree if you pay the fine and do all the other things we ask you to do, you satisfy the terms of this agreement, nothing will even be filed in court. And so those, those agreements are particularly non-public. I question why the Department of Justice ever began to do those in the first place. But some of, particularly those non-prosecution agreements, which you can't get through the court system, there are some of those which had, were sort of, we knew that they existed, but no one had seen a copy of them before. You know, when I first read about the Justice Department moving into deferred prosecution agreements with these corporate criminals, I was pretty astonished because the, the origin of the non-prosecution deal was supposed to be with individual people accused of crimes, often juveniles. Could you explain right. that? And how did they pull it out of the juvenile or street crime arena and apply it to big corporations? And what does this say about the minuscule prosecution budgets in the Justice Department? I'd like your views on that, too. Well, lawyers are nothing if not creative, right? That's Normally, sure. the diversion or, or deferred prosecution agreements, the idea is to give those to the lowest level possible offenders. And it, some of the federal origins were in a Brooklyn plan in the 30s where it was first time drug possession. You know, basically, right, if you stay clean for the next year, we'll, we won't even file charges. We'll let it all drop. And, and most criminal courts have some version of that, uh, some kind of a continuance under supervision. It comes under different names. But the idea is you're, you're being diverted from the regular doc. And we'll keep an eye on you. If you show good behavior, good conduct for a year or two, we'll act like nothing ever happened. We don't, we don't think you're really a criminal and should be treated like a criminal. We just want to watch you for a year or two. And, that, and that's a good idea. And I, I wish they were doing more of that for individual people. Uh, the, the federal government has been really slow to do that. Holder has started to give some speeches saying, you know, in the, in the waning year of his attorney general position that, you know, we should be doing more diversion for individual people so that fewer people have criminal records who don't deserve them. For corporations, though, there was a rush to extend these options to companies really after the Arthur Anderson case. And the prosecution of Arthur Anderson uh, led to the, in part, to the demise of that accounting firm. And there's all this criticism of the DOJ. You just destroyed one of the big five accounting firms. You, you need to think of some better way to, to, to take on corporate prosecutions. And what they decided to do was to, to go more lenient. You know, we've been trying for years to get the Justice Department to start a corporate crime database. You know, they have a street crime database, the 10 most wanted criminals, but they don't have a corporate crime database. We met with attorney generals over 30 years with the support of Congressman John Conyers, who at various times was chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and nothing ever happened. So when Eric Holder became attorney general under Barack Obama, we said, oh, good, we're going to try to meet with him. He would never meet with us. He would never meet with a delegation of citizen groups who have a record of studying and challenging corporate crime. So without a corporate crime database, you don't get enough reporting. You don't get enough analysis of priorities by prosecutors. It's very serious deficiency. What's your view on that? And do you think that the law students and some of these courses in law school can take that up as a cause? Well, in part, that's what I've done in my work is that th there was no one place to look to find out how these corporate cases were being resolved. And so with the help of the UVA Law Library, I've created this huge online archive of corporate prosecution resolutions. We think we have every, or at least just about every, deferred and non-prosecution agreement entered since the 90s. And we've been doing the same now with plea agreements and convictions of corporations, although we don't include traffic tickets and the like. And it's possible some of the information is incomplete, but we've come through the federal dockets to try to locate every resolution of a corporate prosecution since 2001. And we've been updating it 
you know, it, it shouldn't be the kind of thing that a law professor does with the help of a lot of students and the law library. There should be an official government source. The Sentencing Commission does provide information on corporations that are sentenced each year, but I found some of their data to be incomplete, and most important, they don't have information on companies that are not sentenced and that get these deferred and non-prosecution agreements. I don't understand why the Department of Justice doesn't do it. The fines that they've been obtaining in these cases have skyrocketed, and so it would actually be a good opportunity for them to brag about the things that they have accomplished over the last decade or so. Yeah, the, prob uh, the problem is the fines go into the general treasury. As you know, they don't go into expanding the corporate crime enforcement budget of the Justice Department. The argument that they give us won't surprise you. It's that we don't have anything against setting up a corporate crime database, but we have to have an appropriation from Congress giving us the money to do so. So you go to Congress and you meet the corporate lobbies, of course, who work overtime to cut the enforcement budgets of the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Railroad Administration, EPA, et cetera. So it gets to be a vicious circle of passing the buck. Now, let me ask you this. It's often said, well, you can't put a corporation in jail, but you can pull a corporate charter, you can put a corporation on probation. Can you describe for our listeners what a variety of sanctions that could be put on the corporate entity itself, which, as you know, is not a human being? Yeah, or even, well, so the concept of corporate criminal liability is actually much broader in federal court in the U.S. than any other country in the world. And the standard is that a corporation is criminally liable for the crime of any employee committed in the scope of their employment, basically, if they're on the job. And even if it's to benefit the employee, if the employee's trying to benefit themselves, if, it, if there's some benefit to the firm, fine. It's just a very, very broad standard. That said, there's thousands of white-collar cases that prosecutors bring every year against individuals. There are only 150, 200 cases they bring against corporations. So a lot of the time they decide this employee was doing something on their own. We're not going to charge the corporation too. In practice, they don't charge corporations very often. But the standard in theory is really, really broad. Now, what can prosecutors do to a company if they decide a company has committed a crime through one of its employees? They can fine the company. The sentencing guidelines say that if it's a through and through criminal company, you can fine it out of existence. And so there is a corporate death penalty. You fine it an amount equal to all of its assets. It's occasionally been used when prosecutors basically conclude this company is a criminal front. Normally not. But the fines have in general grown large. You, you never used to see billion dollar fines, not, not before the last few years. Aside from fining, and obviously there are problems with fining a company, the fine isn't going to be paid by the employees who committed the crimes. Shareholders or consumers may bear those costs. It may not be the managers, the higher ups, you know, none, none of them may be affected in the right way by the fine. Now, you can also impose other types of financial penalties. You can ask the company to pay the victims, restitution. You can make good those people who were harmed. The companies can be ordered to do community service, including to try to remedy the type of harm to the public that occurred, like in environmental cases. They actually have the company not just pay to do the cleanup, but pay money to have say, the Coast Guard study the conditions in the Gulf after the Gulf spill to find out whether things are really recovering or not. So that's money. Companies can also be ordered to change their practices, to be on probation, to be watched by a monitor, to make sure that they don't do it again. And that can be really important. That's one advantage of having a company convicted in court. There's a judge supervising probation, sometimes for two, three, or more years, often with a specialized person, a monitor, checking up on the company regularly to make sure that it's following the rules. So a company can also be ordered to make changes in its practices, to hire compliant staff to do things to make sure it doesn't happen again. So there are, there are a lot of useful things. That, finally, a company can be ordered or agree, usually they agree, to cooperate in investigations of the individual wrongdoing. You have to tell us who did what. You have to give us the documents, the emails. You must fully cooperate in our investigation of what really happened and who's responsible. So that's, that's another important goal of corporate and criminal liability. How about removal of the officers of the corporation and or the board of directors for egregious failure to engage in their fiduciary responsibility and obey the law? Agencies can do that. Prosecutors don't normally condition criminal settlements on that, but regulatory agencies do that. And the, it's the regulatory agencies that also have the authority to debar or suspend companies from doing certain types of business. Now, the prosecution agreements don't normally directly order that, but agencies in their rules about suspension and debarment can say that, look, if you commit a felony in this industry, 
you can't do business with the federal government, or you may be suspended for the period of a, of a year or for however long. Arthur Anderson, when they were convicted of obstruction of justice uh, back in 2002, they were fined $500,000. That didn't matter. What mattered was that the Securities and Exchange Commission said that, well, now that your company is a felon, it can no longer do business with public companies. You can't do accounting work for public companies as a felon. Once Arthur Anderson was disqualified from doing work for, uh, for public companies, that was the end of the company. That for a big five accounting firm, that's what they do. And so it was the regulatory consequence of the conviction that really destroyed Arthur Anderson, not the fine. The fine didn't matter. Before we conclude, Professor Garrett, we were talking with Professor Brandon Garrett, University of Virginia Law School, author of the new book, Too Big to Fail, How Prosecutors Compromise with Corporations. What about debarment? Can you explain to our listeners as a corporate sanction by the Justice Department, debarment? What does that mean? Well, debarment would be an agency saying that you can't do work with the federal government or you're suspended from doing work. It can be used against individuals, too. You know, for example, BP was, was suspended from, doing, from bidding on Gulf drilling contracts for over a year, I think, after the, the Gulf spill. And that was enormously consequential to them, maybe more important to them than the billions of dollars in fines that, that BP had to pay. Or selling oil to for, the federal for, for, government selling oil to the federal government. Well, that was bidding on the, on the drilling leases, which is uh-huh. uh, the ability to do exploration for oil for any purpose. For some companies, you know, the, the debarment creates an, uh, sort of a do, too big to debar dynamic. And so you have the biggest misdemeanor cases on earth involving big pharma companies. Pharmaceutical companies have paid some of the biggest corporate fines in memory. The first billion dollar corporate fine was paid by a subsidiary of, of uh, Pfizer. Those cases are all misdemeanors. And so you have billion-dollar misdemeanors. A misdemeanor is normally a traffic ticket, right? a non-felony, no jail time for individuals. These are billion-dollar misdemeanors. How can that be? Well, it's because a company convicted of a felony would be debarred from doing business with federal health insurance for Medicaid and Medicare. And you know, in some ways, Pfizer has to know, a big pharma company has to know, they're not going to be debarred. You can't have no federal Medicaid, Medicare patients having access to drugs from a major pharmaceutical company like Pfizer. There'll be lives at stake. And so realistically, they may sort of know, you know, we're not going to get debarred. And so the cases always get negotiated to avoid that existential threat to the company, but also the serious health consequences to patients. They, they always avoid debarment. And instead, they plead guilty but to a misdemeanor. You've been listening to Professor Brandon Garrett, one of the country's top experts on corporate crime, author of the new book, Too Big to Fail, How Prosecutors Compromise with Corporations. Let me ask you one last question. This is for the benefit of our our listeners. Have you ever heard a discussion on corporate crime like this on public radio, on public broadcasting, on Diane Rehm's show, on Charlie Rose's show? Why not? It's up to you to demand more media attention to a vast corporate crime wave that is reported on in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, corporate crime reporter, but has hardly entered the electoral scene. When's the last time you saw any candidates for public office be required to take a stand on how tough they're going to be on corporate crime in comparison with street crime? Corporate crime negligence takes far more lives produces far more injuries and costs Americans far more in billions of dollars than street crime. And yet it still is not front and center in our media. So how can people listening to this program, Professor Garrett, reach you? Can you give them your contact information and do you have a blog? Sure. Yeah, I have have Too Big to Jail has a website. I have a website. You can email me at the University of Virginia. If people are interested in reading about corporate crime, they can read the book, but you can also look online at these archive pages at the University of Virginia Law Library. I have these pages where you can look down and see every corporation that has received a deferred and non-prosecution agreement. You'll see a lot of household name companies, everyone from Google to BP to, to Pfizer to all the major banks. You'll see recidivist companies that have received out-of-court deals multiple times in the last few years for all sorts of different offenses. And the website and so you, again? And you can read these agreements. And the website again? Uh, it's easiest just to, just to go to the University of Virginia, look for my name, Brandon Garrett, and there are links to, to these websites. We're in the process of redoing them, actually, to make them even even fancier. Well, you'll, you'll be able to sort them by fine, see the biggest fines, or you can look for the bribery cases or the fraud cases or the cases with banks. But right now, you can certainly look at the list of companies and sort them by name, by year, and look at all kinds of information about what these companies actually agreed to when they were prosecuted. And so as as a lawyer, I I encourage people to look at the raw materials, too. Although, of course, I'm happy if people read my book. 
well said. We really want the listeners to recommend the book to their local library, even buy the book and give it to the local library. They have hard-pressed budgets these days. The more people understand in detail the double standard of justice, the more we're going to get action on corporate crime enforcement and the deterrence of future corporate crime. Leave you with one little example, Professor Guerra. A few years ago, a 52-year-old man who didn't have health insurance decided that he had to rob a bank in order to go to jail and get health treatment because people in jail are covered by health insurance. So he walks into a bank and he demands $100. They give him $100. He flees. He has a pangs of conscience. Two days later, he turns himself in to the local police. He gets prosecuted. The judge puts him away for 15 years. And all he did was try to get medical treatment in jail, which he couldn't afford outside of jail. Isn't that amazing contrast with what corporate criminals get away with these days. I want to thank you very much, uh, Professor Garrett. Keep up the good work and keep those students alert to the corporate crime wave. Great to talk to you. Our guest has been the author of Too Big to Jail, Brandon L. Garrett. Remember to subscribe to this program for free on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you've missed any of this episode on the radio, go to our website, ralphnaderradiohour.com, and catch up on what you've missed on this or any of our other 75 programs, which are all archived there. And while you're there, click on the link that will take you to Ralph's latest book, Return to Sender, Unanswered Letters to the President, 2001 to 2015. I want to thank our guests today, Craig McDonald, Director of Texans for Public Justice. Please go to tpj.org to learn more. Go to nader.org for Ralph's weekly blog. For more of Russell McIver, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And if you've missed any of this or any of our other episodes, please go to ralphnaderradiohour.com. Steve Scrovan will be back with us next week. Our producers are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew, Mar- Matthew Marin. I'm David Feldman. Talk to you next week, Ralph. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, listeners. Be active. Be part of that 1% that can turn our country around if it reflects majority opinion, as it does on full Medicare for all. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Thieves in the temple. Too much money changing hands It's really very simple Just make a list of demands We demand freedom We demand equality We demand justice It ain't gonna happen until folks like you and me just stand up Well, you've been sitting way too long Oh, step up You know what's right and you know what's wrong Rise up Don't let the system hold you down Stand up, stand up You've been sitting way too long Wow, wow Say you're tired of trying You say we have no choice Say you're just one person And who will hear your voice Don't let them fool you You have the power in your hand